so as a way to begin our conversation, uh, a simple question. Are regions, uh, is uh, regionalism uh, a new phenomenon? Not at all, certainly not. It, it's not uh, a recent thing, but it's a booming event. But the best way to, to try to explain that why it is booming is to start and say something about what exactly is regionalism, what is a region. Because region is one of these container concepts that have different meanings. And it's very important right from the beginning to understand what we are talking about. So basically, the definition about a region that we use here at, in, in Bruges at you and you, Chris, is that we can consider every territory on the planet Earth that is not a state, but that has some statehood properties as a region. So this means that, on the one hand, you can divide the world in states, but there are other, multiple other ways to divide the world, and that is dividing the world into regions. Now, the interesting thing is that these regions occur at different geographical levels. You can find them within states, you can find them above states, and you can find them across states. Let me give some, some examples. The, the most obvious one uh, is, is the level of regions above states, where we have a number of neighboring states that group themselves together and try to act in a unified way. The classic example is, for instance, the European Union, but also the African Union, Mercosur, ASEAN, and many others. So that is above the state level. But next to that, we also see that we can have regions that operate within a state. Again, in Europe, an example would be the lender in Germany. And finally, but that's not an, as widespread phenomenon, but still it exists, we can have regions across borders. If you take uh, the triangle between three cities like uh, Maastricht in the Netherlands, Aachen in Germany, and Liège in Belgium, you can see that there is some kind of economic cooperation and also cultural cooperation going on. And in that sense, you can call that a region. So a region is not a state, but it is a unit of governance that has some statehood property. So in other ways, regions can act as if there are states. And you can see that, for instance, by the fact that regions can have the same symbols, such as states. They can have flags, hymns, but they can also have the same institutions, parliaments. We have a European parliament. In Belgium, we have a parliament of the Flemish region, and so on. So institutions, symbols, and also they take over some of the core functions of the competencies of the different uh, states. So in that sense, you can say that right from the very origin of the sovereign state, going back to the Treaty of Westphalen, we see that always there have been regions uh, around. But, as I said, it's only since the last, let's say, three to four decades that the numbers of regions and the, the, the amount of regional governance has been booming uh, all over the world. And, and it's certainly so, uh, based on what you're saying, it's certainly not uh, a European phenomenon. It's not only a European phenomenon. Absolutely. You, you can find regions everywhere in the world. I mean, take, uh, let's say, in Asia, you have Indonesia, which is a very decentralized, regionalized uh, country. Uh, you have regional organizations at a supranational level, as I said. In Africa, there are plenty of them. In Asia, in Latin America, etc. And the interesting thing is that, for instance, if you go to the supranational level, that it does not mean that one area of the planet coincides with one regional organization. You can have overlaps of many uh, regional organizations, and that makes it a very complex governance uh, issue. You, you distinguished among uh, regions within states, uh, regions above states, and uh, regions across states. So is there a way to somehow uh, establish a timeline uh, when it comes to these uh, different kinds of regions? I mean, for instance, uh, uh, regions within states, uh, do we have them um, uh, more recently than in the past? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, these forms of regions, I mean, yeah. do they correspond to, to certain well, periods of time uh, in history? Well, not really. If, if you look at the, the historical evolution of, of the concept and, and the practice of sovereign states, you can see that that has been a long process of what I would call integration and disintegration forces. For, right from the beginning, there have been tendencies to create bigger governance entities, sometimes by conquering neighboring uh, states, by, by uh, annexations and stuff like that, but sometimes also by just peaceful 
cooperation. And on the other hand, there always have been tendencies of devolution, of disintegration of existing states. And it is in the course of, of all those histories that you will see regions existing, uh, disappearing, coming back to the forefront. I mean, take for instance a country that everybody sees nowadays as, as one single very important sovereign state, the United States of America. At the origin, it was a collection of states. And the interesting thing is that right from the beginning, you had two views on where to go with the United States of America. One view was to have a kind of loose confed uh, confederation where California, Texas, and the other states would remain sovereign states themselves. And the other view was to go to really a very integrated space, which we call now the United States uh, of America. And some similar stories can be told about uh, almost every country on the earth take over the integration process uh, in Italy that, that was completed with Garibaldi and, and others and things like that. So uh, to these forms of regions, uh, we don't have uh, corresponding periods of time, you know, things appear, disappear and so on. So implicitly what you are yeah. seeing also is that uh, uh, if we are witnessing at one point of time, uh, at one point in time, uh, a, a process of uh, regionalization, it doesn't mean that this process of, of regionalization is going to be with us forever. It can also uh, be reversed. And so it, 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 of course. It, of yes. course. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But the thing is that, uh, let's say, after the Second World War, there has been more or less a stabilization in the number of states. Mm -hmm. I think in 45 we had about 75 states, the, the ones that, that came together to form the United Nations. And by now that has mounted to about 200. And the latest big creation of new states was when the Soviet system uh, collapsed. But nevertheless, there is a slow a tendency to keep more or less the same amount of states at this moment. Some exceptions here and there uh, not to, to mention. But on the contrary, the number of regional governance units within states has been increasing over the last 50 years. There has been some recent uh, study that demonstrates uh, that. And especially uh, the number of supranational regional organizations. And, and the, the main indicator here is the number of regional trade agreements, which is a kind of embryo of a regional organization. And there you could see that um, in, in 1990 we already had 20 or 30 regional trade agreements that were notified to the WTO. And by now it's more than 300, close to 400 already. So there is indeed a tendency of booming regional uh, integration and of booming regional governance. Although it, it has to be said that most of these regional trade agreements are only embryomatic forms of uh, cooperation. So, so you would say, Luke, that in fact, uh, 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 regionalization is one of the defining trends of, uh, of uh, international order with globalization uh, since uh, the uh, 1980s? Yes, indeed, absolutely, yeah. And of course, that is related to a number of driving forces. And, and one of the main driving forces, I guess, is globalization. Mm -hmm. It becomes uh, more and more obvious that uh, all what we do in terms of economic activities, in terms of all kinds of governance activities, are interrelated to each other, which means that single states have less ability to act on their own and to try to deal with the global challenges uh, separately. And that increases the, the need, I guess, for regional governance at the supranational level, at least. So, so you are telling us that in fact uh, one of the drivers of globalization, of regionalization, is globalization. But isn't it paradoxical? Because in a way, globalization is about, uh, you know, having the world coming together. At least this is one of the possible interpretations of globalization. And yet, another possible interpretation of regionalization is, to, to some extent, uh, a fragmentation of the world. So, yes. so how do you how do you explain this kind of paradox? Right. Well, um, it, it's true, it, it looks like a, a paradox, uh, but on the other hand, I, I think that the two phenomena of, of integration, disintegration, or fragmentation are indeed closely related to each other. And, and for me, this, the way that I try to understand it is to bring into account the issue of geographical size of states. So we had this very long process of state formation that started more or less in, in Europe and then spread over out all, all over the world. And in that long process, 
the end result, as we see it today, is a collection of, what is it, uh, close to 200 states that exist now in the world, but that are very different in geographical size and in, uh, also in, in terms of GDP, population, and stuff like that. So we have a number of very huge states, China, Brazil, uh, Russia, and then we have a quite a big collection of very small states. Mm -hmm. Some of them are really very, very small. Think of Luxembourg in, in Europe or the, the little islands in the Pacific and stuff like that. And this creates, um, in terms of economic competition, a kind of imbalance. It is very difficult for a tiny, small state to compete with the big states. And one of the reasons is that your uh, internal market, where the companies first can sell their, their products are simply not big enough to, to, to have an, enough capacity uh, to compete with the big players. But there is another thing related to that. That is that this somehow complicates the functioning of multilateralism and the functioning of the United Nations. Why? Because in the United Nations, we start from the principle that one state has one vote in the General Assembly, which means that the vote of China equals the vote, let's say, of Luxembourg. And with all due respect of our friends in Luxembourg, we can easily see that that's not that really how it should be. There is a yeah. problem there. This also means that at this moment, in theory, you could have at the United Nations General Assembly a majority of states that pushes towards a certain resolution, but that majority of states does not necessarily represent the majority of the population on the planet Earth. So there is this imbalance that makes the functioning of the United Nations uh, difficult. And there, I think, uh, bringing in regional, uh, the, the regional dimension at the supranational level could be an opportunity for the UN to have a kind of more balanced system of representation. So in, in the modern era, I mean, in the past uh, uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, uh, regionalization has been very often a, a tool for small states or, or, or states of, of a middle size to really be able to compete at the global level. But so this is, uh, you tell us, one of the key uh, reasons behind modern, if you will, contemporary regionalization. Uh, has it been the case uh, in other uh, moments of uh, regionalization in the past? I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, earlier uh, uh, these uh, regional connections existing among cities in Europe, in Central Europe. So the, 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 the drivers for regionalization today, are they the same than the drivers for uh, regionalization, you know, a few centuries ago? Some of the economic drivers definitely are the same. I mean, uh, the creation of, of the state of Germany was actually the result of uh, one of the very first regional trade agreements, the, the mm -hmm. German uh, Zollverein. And, and so you can see everywhere in the world there has been a tense. But the point is that, yes, economy and, and competition is one of the main drivers, but it's not the only one. There is another as important driver, or there are two other important drivers. The one is security issues, that you try to cope with security issues at the regional level. Because quite a lot of security issues do not stop at borders. Sometimes the, the part of the problem can be just indeed being across uh, the border, and that needs uh, some kind of, of cooperation of neighboring states. The same goes for all kinds of, of uh, let's say, more practical uh, or concrete issues like managing a water basin. As, as a matter of fact, at this very moment when we are talking, we are organizing in Bruges uh, a training seminar for officials uh, in countries from the Mekong Delta to deal with how integration can help them in managing the problems related to the water basin of uh, the Mekong uh, Delta. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, you know, I, I was going to, to ask you uh, uh, the following question. Why are regions being built uh, in a world of states? And in fact, you, you, you gave us part of the answer. You, you mentioned economic reasons. You mentioned uh, uh, security reasons. But I was going to ask you also, beyond these economic and security reasons, do we have also uh, 
social considerations which come into play. I mean, uh, the, the, the theme of this conversation is, the overall theme of this conversation yeah. series is global justice, and clearly in the European context, I mean, uh, beyond the economic agenda, beyond the secret agenda, there is also a social justice agenda. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this social justice, justice agenda, is it something which is specific to the European agenda at the regional level? Uh, first question. And second question, how does this uh, social justice agenda, if it exists, uh, uh, is compatible with a more global social, adjust, uh, social mm -hmm. justice agenda? Right. So uh, that, that's actually a big set of, of questions. Yes. Um, yes. The very first thing is going back to the issue why are regions built? And, and yes. indeed, I think mm -hmm. I gave already some part of the answer. Basically, you could say uh, regions are built because most of the states that exist right now are either too big or too small. Mm -hmm. And if they're too small, there is a tendency to go for uh, groupings at the supranational level. If they are too big, there is a growing tendency of devolution mm -hmm. and, and devolving power to the subnational regions. That can also be for cultural reasons, but that, that's another uh, story. So that is how it works. Economy is a main driver, but mm -hmm. it's not the only one. If you look at the, the, the functioning of a state, you can see there, and, and in that way I will come to the social uh, justice uh, issues. Um, if you s look at the state's functioning, you can make a distinction between three broad areas. The first one is that a state, one country with its borders, is actually trying to form a single economic space, which means that you could freely trade from one point to another point in that state, and that there are no boundaries uh, in the form of taxes for doing that trade from one point to the other. And that the policy of the state towards stimulating the economy is uniform uh, across that country. Mm -hmm. I said in principle because in practice that can uh, differ. Now, that's one thing. The other thing is that the state is the provider of a series of public goods, health, education, justice, etc. And the third element is the state as the sovereign actor, sovereign actor vis-à-vis -vis its mm -hmm. own citizens. It has the right to raise taxes and stuff like that, but also sovereign actor vis-à-vis -vis the outside world where it can represent with one voice the nation or the state if you want. Now what you see is that when you start an economic integration process, sooner or later the other issues will be on the table uh, themselves. For instance, if you say, okay, we're going to create one single economic space between a number of neighboring uh, states. That means that you have to make sure that uh, the tax level system uh, for trading across borders is the same, that you treat your outer borders in the same way and stuff like that. But increasingly, if you try to advance on that level, you have to make sure that your individual states uh, cannot uh, disturb that process of economic integration. And you need somehow to control the rest, which brings you to economic policy. And there mm -hmm. is a need to have one kind of common economic policy, which is, by the way, one of the main problems today of, of the European Union, that it has not really uh, advanced far enough in, in having this single economic policy. But if you talk about single economic policy, you also talk, for instance, about a single innovation policy. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about innovation policy, you talk about research. And if you talk about research, research you talk about higher education. So you start with economy and you end up with totally different issues like, for instance, the need to harmonize the educational uh, systems in uh, the given regional area. Mm -hmm. And in that process, social issues, issues of values of how you organize your society, how you organize labor, uh, environmental standards become, of course, important. And this is where I think one of the unique aspects of, of the European Union uh, as, as an historical enterprise is, is, is exactly that uh, it tries to not only create one single space socially, environmental, etc., but it still has a lot mm -hmm. of problems in those things, but also it tries to bring that to the outer world and, and say, okay, when we are doing business with the rest of the world, we want to bring in these uh, aspects of social considerations of environmental con norms and things like that, which is not an easy thing, because at first sight it totally makes sense that you say, okay, if we are trading with countries of the south, mm 
we want to make sure that the products that are fabricated over there and that enter the European Union, that they are fabricated in such a way that uh, they agree with the, the rules and the environmental norms that we think that in Europe should be followed. That makes sense. But the problem is, of course, that in the developing countries, this is often perceived as some kind of protectionism, that the developing country will say, hey, wait a moment, you're telling us that you care about the environment, but in reality, you're only doing this because you want to make sure that our products uh, cannot freely enter your market. So there is, there is a, a very difficult issue there on, on to make sure that you can uh, promote free trade in regional trade agreements on the one hand, and on the other hand, that you, cannot, that you should not see it as a kind of new protectionism. So that is, for me, one uh, clear area where the social dimension is uh, important. And another issue is, of course, that by grouping, bringing together the resources at the European level, you can present yourself as a more uh, powerful, if you want, uh, actor. This is actually what I think is happening in the field of uh, development issues. Yes, all of the member states of the European Union still have their own development policy, but still they try to coordinate. And in global, the EU now, the EU member states, are the most important uh, donors to the United Nations for development issues. Mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned earlier in your description of the functions of the state these uh, this, uh, three elements. Uh, first of all, uh, a single economic space, which leads to uh, unified policy. Uh, second of all, uh, you mentioned uh, the, provide, uh, pro the, the, the fact that the state uh, generates public goods. And thirdly, you know, of course, the state as a sovereign actor, and of course, the, the, the possibility of social and economic justice and, and, and therefore of political justice is very, very much uh, linked at the, at the state level with these three functions. So uh, are you witnessing, for instance, in the European context, uh, somehow an elevation at the regional level of these uh, three functions that we are now that we have been historically witnessing at the state level, and therefore are you uh, witnessing uh, in the European context, for instance, the, the fact that uh, uh, through the elevation of these three functions, issues of economic justice, of social justice, and therefore of political justice are really uh, becoming uh, central elements of the project? Mm. Well, I, I think this is a, a difficult issue, because this has always been part of, let's say, the European dream. Uh, mm -hmm. This idea to create is this uh, more or less unified uh, Europe. But what we are seeing uh, lately is, uh, I would say, even uh, close to the opposite. That there seems to be a tendency in, in quite a lot of uh, European states uh, not to go that road and to question issues of, of, for instance, solidarity between the member states. I think the Greek uh, <laughs> crisis shows this very well. So at this moment, we are witnessing a kind of um, revival of some, well, let's call it nationalist uh, tendencies, quite often merged with, with more populist uh, ideas. So you could not say that the European project is really in, in a linear way uh, going uh, in that direction. But of course, on the other hand, if, if you start a regional integration process, you start with, with ideas. And the ideas have always been to come to, to as, as some scholars have said, to an ever deeper and wider uh, Europe, and, and that still mm -hmm. is in the mind of, of a lot of scholars and politicians. I mean, uh, not that long ago, a couple of years ago, uh, the former Belgian Prime Minister, Hiever Hofstadt, wrote a little book with the title, The United States of Europe. Mm -hmm. And that title was only the reflection of, of what years before him, Churchill also said. So it, it, the idea to integrate, to unite, is still there. But I would say that at this moment, it's perhaps not uh, a very popular uh, idea, and, and you could question what are the reasons for that, but it, it's clear that, that with the economic crisis, the boundaries of solidarity are, are questions by, questioned by some yeah. people. You, you mentioned the word solidarity, and in fact you are right, historically, I mean, the, the modern European state, at least the welfare state, has very much been based on this idea of social and economic solidarity within borders, and one, one could argue that in a way, uh, what has also inhabited the European project was somehow uh, uh, the attempt to regionalize this idea of solidarity beyond borders within the European context. But you are telling and us that, that uh, you are telling us that in fact somehow this is uh, yes. at stake. It is, it is currently yes. undermined. Uh, I think so. And, and 
it could be related to that other important driving force that we haven't discussed yet, that is security issues. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people who originally had this idea, this, this dream of a unified Europe were largely driven by security issues, not by economic integration. The economic integration was the tool to obtain a safe Europe where we could avoid that the big powers such as France and Germany and, and England would again fight uh, with each other. So the driving force was uh, security. For a lot of people nowadays in, 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 in Western Central Europe, this seems so evident that it's not felt in daily life as a necessity to continue to work along those lines. But there is another important uh, thing that, that has changed. That was <clears throat> that the original um, impetus for starting the integration process came from the Marshall Plan. We mm -hmm. had, after the Second World War, the devastated economic situation in Europe. It was the big American injection of, of dollars, uh, but it was done in such a way that it was conditioned to creating the space of solidarity between uh, European states. The Marshall Plan explicitly said we are not going to give money to each of the countries separated. We give it to Europe in a whole, and you guys have to organize yourself and see that you come to some kind of, of integration. So the issue to deal with security was important, and on the other hand, there was this the, the available money that could uh, spark off the integration process. And then I think it was the, the, the genius of, of the leaders of that time, uh, Schumann, uh, Jean Monnet and, and others, to say, OK, what can we do to prevent that France and Germany go to war again, uh, as they've done so many times in the past? Well, what we should do is link their basic economies in such a way that if you would attack the other country, you're almost destroying your own economy. And that's why at that moment they started with integrating the steel, uh, integrating the economic, the, uh, the coal uh, industry uh, as a kind of trigger for the rest of the European uh, integration. And all of these things, of course, at this moment are not there anymore. What remains is an ever complex globalized world where people are scared to lose their jobs and stuff like that. So that explains it, I guess, a little bit why perhaps there is a little bit or even a lot of less talk about solidarity than there used to be. So, so in fact, Luc, you're saying that uh, this kind of uh, desire for economic integration which existed and which was partly the impetus of uh, the European Union uh, in the 50s somehow uh, has dissipated. Uh, I mean, in other words, my question is, do we, do we have a, a, a deeper level of economic integration uh, within the European context, or are we simply witnessing an ever-expanding uh, institutional integration, but at the same time uh, 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 a, a feeling, uh, a lessening of economic integration within the European context? Well, I think the economic integration in, in let's say, the, the, the core member states is, is pretty far advanced, and mm. it, it's impossible to, to, to reverse that, uh, I think. Uh, but the issue is that, um, well, according to my, in my opinion, is that at this moment with globalization, the forces of, of competing with the rest of the world is becoming more and more difficult. So I guess we need more integration if we are able to, if we want to be able in Europe to compete with the rest of the world. And that is perhaps something where not everybody at policy level, let alone in, in the, with the general public, is convinced of at this moment. I mean, uh, so far, do we have European, I mean, what we could call European companies? We, we have, uh, you know, German industrial giants, we have uh, French industrial giants, but do we have what we could call European industrial giants, which, uh, well, you know, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, two or three countries coming together, having come together in the European context and are competing at the global level. Do we have this or not? Well, I think you have some European industries um, that are pretty much uh, the combination of, of what the best of companies are offering in, in countries. I mean, uh, Airbus, for instance, yeah, yeah, that would, would, be, uh, would be one one example of really uh, integrated. Of course, you could also say that still the main players are France and, and, and Germany, but nevertheless, uh, small countries like Belgium also participate mm -hmm. to a large extent to Airbus, and that creates uh, an interesting dynamic of but innovation. Is, yeah, beyond Airbus, because this is always the example well, that you mentioned, yes. how, many, how many others? Very few, probably. 
I guess a bit, but that's probably also because still a lot of industrial activities have to be anchored locally. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very important. I mean, there is a tendency now uh, to, to globalize the production of beer and stuff like that. And Belgium, for instance, is not doing badly on, on that we all. But still, beers have their local brands and it's still important. I mean, it would not be a good idea to go for kind of one European uh, brand of beers or something like that. No, you want to drink Belgian beers, Dutch beers, if, if you really mm -hmm. want to, uh, or uh, German beer or whatever. So the idea of a European brand, I mean, you know, we have American yep. brands, in, it's yep. still uh, uh, very far away ahead. Um, I think so, and I don't think this is high on, on, on the agenda, and because I, again, the, 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 the cultural differences, I mean, on, what happens on the other hand is to make sure, and, and there Europe is very active, the European institutions, to make sure that the local products remain having their local identities. I mean, there is the classical case of the Greek feta. At one point, not that long ago, most of the Greek, so-called Greek feta was produced in Denmark. That had mm -hmm. to be stopped mm -hmm. because now only uh, the Greek can uh, call their goat cheese feta and not uh, the mm -hmm. same goat cheese that is produced in another, in another country. So I think it's, it's more the reverse that is happening. And that is, I guess, very important. Mm -hmm. to, to go back to this idea of solidarity, I mean, uh, uh, which is at the core of, uh, of economic and social and then political justice. I mean, so you tell us that uh, this idea has been part of the European agenda. Uh, since uh, your institute in Bruges is, is very much focusing on the comparative dimension of regionalism, I mean, do you see this notion being present and being strategic enough in other uh, regional uh, exercises uh, in, in Africa, in Asia, and so on? Or are these uh, other processes of uh, uh, regionalization in Africa, uh, in Asia, and Latin America more targeted and, and, and thinner in terms of uh, mm. concerns? Well, yes, exactly. I, I would say that most of the regional integration processes that we see at this moment are thinner than the European one. Mm -hmm. uh, they are more closer to, to real, real trade agreements without building proper institutions and without even thinking of, of a kind of pooled uh, sovereignty. So in that sense, the, 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 the solidarity issues are not that high on, on the agenda. But there are some attempts. Um, if I read the, the recent reports of the Asian development banks about where to go with ASEAN in, in Southeast Asia, you can see clear recommendations that in order to make ASEAN a success story, they need to further develop the institutional part of it. Mm -hmm. And not only the institutional part, but also broaden the agenda from purely economic issues to uh, other issues related to fair trade, like environmental standards, uh, social standards, and stuff like that. And in that respect, uh, the fact that the European Union exists is important. Nobody is saying that the EU should be a model for the rest of the world, because you have to adapt to, to the local circumstances. But it can be a kind of benchmark, and it gives an example of what is possible. And again, in, in that sense, it's, for instance, I think, uh, not, uh, not a coincidence that the Asian Development Bank sends uh, their people to, to Bruges to come and learn what is happening in Europe and how you can draw lessons from that mm -hmm. for the rest of, of the world and for other comparative regional integration schemes. But mind you, there is still a very long way to go on that. Yeah, for, for the building of of, of a regional uh, uh, space and uh, regional uh, institutions, I mean, is it better to have uh, strong states or weak states? I mean, in Euro in the European context, one could mm -hmm. argue, but on the one hand, uh, the European project uh, started out of the strength of the states. On the other hand, it is being partly hampered because of the strength of the yeah. state. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, so is it better to have strong states or weak states to really uh, get this regional project off the ground? And, and, and then, you know, uh, is it possible, for instance, to develop at the, at the uh, regional level sense of solidarity, social and economic solidarity, if the states on the basis of which or uh, in cooperation with uh, this regional organization or regionalism is taking place are not themselves committed to social and economic justice or solidarity. Okay. Uh, answering this question is, is again related to the complex relation between states and regions. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that if, if you start thinking about 
region or regional level of governance, sub or supranational, the very first thing that you need is ideas. I would call it, you need a dream about where to go with, with your region. Then you can have driving forces that drive you towards that uh, goal or not. But at the end of the day, the regional governance only exists if a state allows it to. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The European countries, none of them have been forced into European integration. It is only because at one day the heads of, of, of states sign the treaty that they move on. It's the same with processes of devolution. Uh, in Belgium we had a series of state reforms that gave quite a lot of power to the subnational regions, but each step has been the result of a decision of the central state. So the state decides to give some of its sovereignty, if you want, to either the sub or the supranational level. And in that sense, the question weak or strong states is, is answered because you need to be a strong state before you will be willing to do mm -hmm. that. If we are talking with a weak state, meaning states in the sense of, of having weak institutions, etc., most of these people will be very, very careful about uh, devolving power or becoming part of an integrated uh, scheme because they, they, they are more afraid that they will lose uh, the, 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 the sense of insecurity will lead them to be very, yes. uh, to be, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. focus, to, to focus yes. on control, on control. Definitely. Now that is applying the weak, strong dimension to the functioning of the state internally, but you mm -hmm. can also apply that dimension to the, the, let's say, the position of the state on, on, on the world stage, uh, where maybe the opposite is true where you can say, if you're a strong world player, then mm. why should you go for integration? Because that would yes. mean that you have to share uh, your power with, with others. Uh, on the contrary, if you're too small, for instance, to compete on the world stage, then that should drive you as a state towards uh, integration. Again, uh, this issue is linked to the size of states. If, if you look to the size of the European states, uh, you, with a little bit of exaggeration, you can say that all the European states are small states on a world scale, so they have a big benefit uh, to work together. If you take the perspective of Brazil or China or Russia, that's totally different. So the, the issue of threshold is very, very important because you are telling us that uh, you know, it's, it's important to have strong states to, 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 to have actors being secure enough to be willing to somehow yeah. end over part of their powers. But on the other hand, you know, if you really are very, very, I mean, if one actor is very, very powerful, what is the point of, of somehow go so, for devolution yeah, 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 of power? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that then brings in an, another and for me fascinating dimension of the, the whole issue of building regions. So mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. are states that are building regions. They build regions that look like states, they are not states, but they look like states. They can have the symbols, they can have some of the, the, the institutions, the instruments, the, the functions and stuff. But once they are created, they start having a life of their own. And in my book, I uh, illustrated by using the metaphor of uh, Frankenstein. It's a little mm -hmm. bit uh, like Frankenstein who created something that was not a human being, but could act as if it was a human being. And at the end of the day, uh, the monster, as it was uh, called in Frankenstein's novel, uh, turned against his creator. Now, I'm, I'm not implying that mm -hmm. regions should be compared with monsters, but they can become independent actors, and at that point, at one point, they can indeed turn against uh, the, the states that have created them, and that creates, that, that gives rise to, to a very interesting complex uh, dynamics. Uh, the, the European Commission, for instance, in Europe, can uh, act against member states if they not comply with commission rules. Uh, mm -hmm. Regions in, in European countries can attack to, to the Supreme Court, uh, the federal state and stuff like that. So that creates a totally new structure of, of governance, mm -hmm. which is, I think, uh, very complex on the one hand, but also I would say very promising because it creates a much more open system of, of governance where you can have a kind of balance of power between the different levels of, of government. And that in itself
I guess, uh, could contribute to more global social justice. justice. Yeah, but, yeah, and, and, and what about precisely uh, these regions so where uh, regionalize, uh, regionalism is on the rise, and yet, you know, it's really, well, maybe it's not, I don't know, uh, but it's, ba it's, 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 it's based on very weak states. I mean, that's the case in Africa, that's the case yeah. in, in Latin America. So what's, uh, you know, what's the end game uh, yeah. in these kind of uh, situations? But I think, uh, it, and what Africa, are the hopes? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, first of all, Africa is in itself a huge continent. Eh? So there you have different overlapping forms of region integration. There is the African Union, continent-wise, and then you have quite a number of subcontinental regional organizations. Um, most of them are very, very weak organizations, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, also because the member states do not have the resources uh, to invest in them, so they are totally dependent on, on other actors. And in some cases, they are what I would call paper tigers. Eh? They exist on paper, and, and they act as if they should be considered at the same level of, of, let's say, the European Union or the League of Arab States or whatever, but that's not the case. So the African issue remains a huge problem. And I would say, first things first, what we first need to do is invest in state development in Africa, and then you can talk about integration. But it makes no sense to first have integration efforts and then, uh, I mean, integrating, an, I'm exaggerating now a little bit, but integrating a collection of weak states mm -hmm. still remains a weak uh, state or weak integration scheme, if you want. And that is really the problem in Africa. On the other hand, you can see, and this has been demonstrated by, by lots of economists, political scientists, all, all the benefits uh, for Africa because it creates first larger internal markets, it can create security communities to overcome ethnic divides and stuff like that. So it's very clear that the benefits uh, are there. And what about the Mercosur? Well, the Mercosur is, is I would say, a, a story with ups and downs uh, related to the very, again, complex history of, of Latin America. And at this point, of course, everybody is, is focusing now on, on Brazil that is developing as one of the BRICS as, as one of the regional powers, and it remains to be seen for me how that will affect in, in the future the functioning of Mercosur and of the other regional... Well, Brazil is part of Mercosur or not? Uh, you got me on that one. I'm not... Yes, I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Okay. But everybody, in, I mean, everybody looks to Brazil in terms of what will happen yes. with Mercosur. Okay. And, and the relation between Argentina and, Mer and uh, Brazil and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now t talking about or thinking about the relationship between the, the, the regional level and the global level, I mean, uh, in your view, what is the, 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 um, the contribution of the regional enterprise, I mean, in Europe, but also beyond Europe, to, um, uh, to, to, to um, the demands of justice at the global level. Earlier in the conversation, you talked about the fact that uh, regionalization in the modern era developed as a way to, to try to somehow be able to have states being able to compete uh, in the context of globalization. So, you know, um, for instance, in the field of development, what is, what is uh, the, uh, the, the contribution of, uh, of regionalism to somehow uh, the lessening of poverty? Um, uh, in, in the world, I mean, both in terms of uh, aid regimes, in aid contribution, but in also in terms of uh, or, or in terms of trying to make the situation on the ground better in, in Southeast Asia or in uh, in Latin America or in Africa, for that matter. Well, what I would say I mean, is, is that. Yeah. In, in, yeah. in, in, you know, just to make my uh, my question more straightforward, simpler, yeah. you know, uh, what is the contribution of uh, regionalism to uh, global economic or social justice, if you will? I mean, uh, well, in my view, that contribution is not directly towards what is happening in the field, but more indirectly towards the functioning of the United Nations. And mm -hmm. let me explain. Uh, I think if we want global social justice, we also need a strong, which means an efficient and an effective functioning of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. But remember what I said about the differences in sizes, that that creates a problem for the, the UN, um, also the, how the Security Council is composed, etc. My view is that bringing in the regional dimension in the functioning of the UN, 
can make the UN a better organization. Mm -hmm. And this is actually not a very new idea because uh, when we go back to the times that the United Nations were created in 1945, the famous San Francisco Conference, already at that moment there was a big debate, for instance, in terms of security, in, in governing security issues, whether we should go to a system of having a, working with a number of so-called regional security councils or, on the contrary, having one global security council. Churchill, for instance, was a big defender of the idea to work with regional security councils. But as everybody knows, at the end of the day, it was the Global Security Council that uh, was taken as uh, a model. Well, but if you look at the Charter of the United Nations, you can see some uh, reminiscences of that discussion in the Charter. For instance, Chapter 8 of the Charter gives the opportunity for the UN to build partnerships with regional organizations for peacekeeping, peace building uh, operations, which is very important because that means that you can bring back some of the legitimacy issues to the more local level if you're dealing with uh, a conflict. Now, mm -hmm. when the Charter was drafted in 1945, the idea to bring in the regional level of governance was, was quite revolutionary because, frankly, there was only one regional organization that really existed, that was the League of Arab States. Mm -hmm. And there were some dreams about European integration, but nothing materialized. That well, what happened then is with the Cold War, that whole chapter 8 was never put into practice with some small uh, examples, uh, but nevertheless. And it's only now, since the end of the Cold War, that there is a new window of opportunity to have this kind of partnerships between the UN and regional organizations. And in that sense, I think what, what happened uh, with the recent uh, Libya resolution yes. is, is important, uh, because it was the United Nations Security Council that voted the resolution, adopted the resolution, but in the resolution it was clearly stated that it was done with the support of the League of uh, Arab States and other regional organizations, which brings in the kind of legitimacy uh, aspect. And that is for me one road where we should go. We could also think more in detail about how we can have a further division of labor between peace, peace, peacekeeping, peace building operations done or organized at the level of the UN or uh, yeah. done at the regional level. So for me this is one of, of the, the big issues that should put on the agenda and as I said the window of opportunity is there um, and, and step by step that window of opportunity is, is becoming more open even huh? uh, only very recently the European Union now uh, obtained uh, to have speaking rights in the General Assembly mm -hmm. and I'm sure that will only be the first of a series of regional organizations that will do the same which means that the whole multilateral system is, is slowly changing. It used to be a club of states uh, that come together in intergovernmental organizations. Now it's a club of states and other actors, mm -hmm. regional actors. And, and that is, in, in my book, I, I, mentioned, I uh, labeled this as the, the move towards multilateralism 2.0. And, mm -hmm. and the whole issue of regionalism for me is that it can help in, in working towards, on the one hand, a more open system of multilateralism, and on the other hand, uh, perhaps also a more efficient and effective multilateral system. Uh, Luc, in fact, you know, you, you, you feel that uh, it would be uh, uh, a good thing uh, for uh, regional actors to, have, to be better represented and to be more active uh, in the UN context, and you, you, you seem to think that uh, the fact that the European Union uh, has now speaking right is only the beginning of a process. Actually, I would very much hope so, that that is indeed uh, the case. And what I would also hope is that the European Union takes the lead in this and, and tries to, to work towards creating uh, spaces of dialogue between the UN and other regional uh, organizations. Uh, for me, that is something that is, as I said, totally in line with the spirit of the UN and the, the famous Chapter 8. But I think it's also uh, in line with, with how the world looks like today. Uh, we have to stop thinking in, in terms of we only have the multilateral system at the global level and then the states, but it's much more complex reality that we have. And mind you, what I just said about regional organizations at the supranational level can also be repeated at the subnational level. Um, and already, again, things are moving. Uh, when you go to, for instance, UNESCO in, in Paris, you will see that all of the member states have their delegations there, but not only the member states. Some regions, think of the Quebec region, they have their own delegation towards uh, UNESCO because 
that is where the competences in, in terms of culture and education uh, are located. So that's for me a fascinating and I would say also a very hopeful uh, development. Yeah. And, and perhaps, Salik, as a way to finish our conversation, how do you see the, the future of, uh, of regionalism and uh, regional organizations uh, in the context of, uh, of world order for the coming uh, 30 to 50 years? So I know that you don't have a crystal ball, but uh, you know, what does the future hold in, in your view when it comes to uh, regionalism? Well, uh, indeed, uh, nobody can predict the future and certainly not social scientists. I think that's not a good idea to ask social scientists to predict the future because uh, but the only thing we can do is, is try to think of what are potential scenarios and also what are the, the, the dreams and the visions, the visions that should and that could emerge. I, I mentioned this, this idea of, of the Frankenstein uh, metaphor where you have a kind of competition or even struggle between different kinds of actors. There is another model uh, possible where you think more in terms of uh, foregoing cooperation. And for me, that is the road that we should go, that all the different levels of governance, starting at, at the very local level, cities and stuff like that, because we didn't talk about cities, but cities are increasingly becoming a very important uh, level of governance as well. And some cities have, have GDPs that are way uh, above the GDPs of, of states. So why are the cities not represented in multilateralism and stuff like that? Anyway, so the, the thing is we have this complex reality and sometimes I have the feeling that the actors at whatever level they are think in terms of competing for this is my topic. I'm the one who's responsible for dealing with this policy issue or the other. The, the opposite thinking that we should uh, try to stimulate is that every level of governance should start working from the principle, what can I do at my level to make the functioning of the other levels as efficient and effective as possible? So for instance, what can the UN do to make states function as well as they could? What can the UN do to make regional organizations function as good as they can? And the same in the reverse way, what can a regional organization do to make the UN function more better? I think that is the direction, or at least the utopian uh, direction that we should uh, go uh, with this idea of multilateralism mode 2.0.